above all wisdom and all the ways of man. You were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all
you for that singing. All right, open up your Bibles, if you will, please, to Luke chapter 9, the Gospel of Luke, the ninth chapter. Um, as a father, um, I have to answer a fair amount of questions. I mean, children, children are inquisitive. Children are curious. Children, well, they have lots of appetites. You know, they have that appetite of the belly. But I think really the most voracious appetite that any human being really has, it's the desire to know. And I'm very glad. You know, sometimes I can get a little put out because, especially as your kids get older, you know, they can come to you when you're really tired and fatigued and you feel a little mentally whipped. And they can put some really doozy questions at you. Let me tell you. So the kind of questions that really, even at my age, you know, I'm supposed to know a lot. And I really have to sit down and think and ponder. And yet, even though in, in, in the circumstances, you know, I might feel like, wow. Do I really have to be thinking all this deep stuff right now and formulating concise answers to very profound questions? But I would much rather they come first of all to me because, well, you know, um, a question in the mind of a man, it's almost like an itch in the middle of the back. You know, he can't quite reach it himself, but he's got to have an answer. And, and my thing is, if my kids don't come to me, they're going to come to somebody. And who knows, they might go to somebody else that might lead them astray or not give them the best information, certainly might not give them the answer that I would. So I, I encourage them to come, first of all, to me. And, you know, we never outgrow that, do we? We never outgrow this need to ask questions. You know, I have so many people have asked me, they say, why do you have so many books on your library shelf? I mean, really, can you read them all? Uh, well, I, the re I do use them all, but the reason I have so many books is because I have so many questions in my mind. Sometimes I want answers. Sometimes I'm seeking information. Sometimes there's this driving need to know. I really want to know. I feel like I have to know because I'm supposed to talk to other people about relevant things. And so in order to know, I got to feed myself. And, I, you know, I, I look at that's how I do it. You know, I choose to buy books. But, you know, when we ask questions, we ask as learners, don't we? Yeah, we're students, and so when we question and we ask a question, it's because we do. We're trying to fetch knowledge out of somebody else. God asks questions. God never asks questions as a learner. <laughs> God asks questions as a teacher, doesn't he? God's questions, really, you want to know, that they're, 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 he plants questions in the mind like a seed in, a, in the soil. He plants that question because he thinks if I can just embed a seed thought in this person's head, then they'll be thinking, they'll have a, a guided meditation in the right area. They'll be thinking about what really matters. And maybe my spirit, by posing this question, can bring them up to higher and more important appreciations of truth. So when God asks a question, he's got an agenda and he's doing it not for his own benefit like he ever, you know, needed anybody to give him an answer. He already knows what's in your own head. No, he asks questions for your benefit. One guy put it this way. He says, God doesn't throw inquiries to the wind. He aims them squarely at us. We are the target on which his interrogatory darts stick. And he does it on purpose. And he does it in the passage that we're going to read today. We're going to read what I believe to be the most vital, the most important question that a person can face in this world today. So if you're in Luke chapter 9, let's begin reading at verse number 18. Luke chapter 9, verse 18, we're going to read down to verse 22. And it came to pass, as he was alone praying... His disciples were with him, and he asked them, saying, Whom say the people that I am? And they, answering, said, well, John the Baptist, but, but some say Elijah, and others say that you know, one of the old prophets is risen. And he said unto them, But whom do you say that I am? And Peter answering said, the Christ of God. And he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected 
of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. Now, I, uh, what we have here, Christ is kind of, you know, he's alone and he's praying, but his, his disciples, they join him and rather than being put out with it, maybe he had been praying for them. It doesn't really say what he'd been praying about, but we read in Luke's gospel, we've read several times where <coughs> Christ had been praying and then sudden happens, whether he has to select the, the 12 that are going to be a special apostles or something, or he has to face the, the enemy in the wilderness. A lot of times when Jesus Christ is praying, something of significance happens, and he uses this as an occasion to kind of ask them a question. So, you know, and, and he, he asks two of them, and the first question is really, it's just a warm-up question, really. And in this kind of, in this sense, he was just soliciting information from them. He was just, hey, what's this talk on the street, guys? Uh, the crowd out there, uh, who do they say that I am? Uh, what, what kind of theories are in circulation out there about my real, actual identity? And, of course, they mentioned, well, some think that you're like John the Baptist. Others think maybe you might be Elijah or Jeremiah or, you know, one of the prophets from long ago has come back or something. But, they, you know, they know that you're somebody. They just haven't figured out what. And so he'd already, he was already, of course, perfectly well aware of what men were thinking. So he asks the second question, and it was the second question which was direct, directed at them and very personal. And really what it was, it, it Christ with this second question, he is soliciting a confession out of them of what they believe. So he says to them, okay, that's the hubbub. Okay, that's, that's what all the crowd out there is thinking. The word on the street is, I'm one of these fellows. Now, you think, you tell me, who do you think I am? And Simon Peter, with kind of characteristic boldness, he blurts out, you are the Christ of God. Now, uh, like I said, I believe that this is one of the most important questions that a, a man can face in this world. And it's just the basic idea. Who is Christ? What was Christ? What do we make of Christ? Christ, Christ, Christ. What think ye of Christ? You know, that's another question we find in another part of the Gospels. They come at us all the time, and they're, they're vitally important. That's my first point here. Let us observe, first of all, you know, that it really does matter. It really does matter who you think Christ is and what you think to be true about Christ. We're, we're living in a generation where people, they think that, you know, you don't have to be accurate so much as you just have to be sincere. I've actually heard people say that, you know what, well, if people have a religious belief, just respect it, you know, because ultimately all these different ideas about God, they're all aimed ultimately at the same being. Oh, the, these guys over here call him Allah. These guys over here call him Jehovah. These guys over here call him Krishna. These guys over here call him, you know, whatever they call him. But it's all the same guy. You know, he just has a multiplicity of different names. By the way, he has a multiplicity of different commandments and personality types so that people, when they ha raise these names up in their mind, they have a, a, a wide variety of differences of opinion as to what that God that they're talking about is, uh, is like. They name him differently and they conceive of him differently. And you know what? Uh, th this whole question right here, you know, Jesus Christ is pointing out the fact that there may be many men with many opinions in their minds as to what Christ is and who he is, but they can be wrong. It matters. He was not John the Baptist. He was not. He was not Elijah. He was not Jeremiah. There's one true answer to that question. And Peter blurts it right out. He says, you are the Christ of God. Now, in calling him Christ, what does that really signify? What does that mean to us? When you say, when he said, you are the Christ, the Christ of God. What was he saying? Well, that word Christ, Greek, Christos, it is the equivalent of the Hebrew word that, you know, is Messiah. 
It means, really, it means the anointed one. The one that God especially promised in the Old Testament scriptures, going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, there was a promise made of God to Adam and Eve even, that there would be one sent into the world that would tackle the issues of evil raised up by the serpent, that would redeem men and that would liberate men from the evil that had befallen the world. And this was a promise. It began with the seed of the woman. It developed and cascaded over time. He made covenants with Noah, with Abraham, right on down through Moses, and even to David. There were special promises. They kept getting more specific. In the Old Testament, the Jews, they understood this to be a promised one, a coming one, an anointed one. One who would embody in himself the offices of prophet, priest, and king. And all of those to the maximum degree because he would bear in his person a special relationship with God. I think they understood that somehow this whole seed of the woman thing meant that God was going to do something supernatural and something special in bringing this being, this one that they would call the Messiah, the promised one into the world. Exactly how accurate they got all that, I don't know, but I know that when uh, we find them in the New Testament. They were looking for Messiah. And Jesus and, and, and Peter says, you're that guy. He says, I've looked two places in order to come to this conclusion. I've looked into the word of God and what the word of God, what his Old Testament promises say about the coming Messiah, about what he would be like and what he would do. And I've also looked at your life, Lord Jesus. And I have looked at you and I see if ever there were a match between the two, you and you alone fit the bill. There's nobody else that I can look to or think about. You must be that promised one. You know, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus Christ looks at him and says, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. My Father and the Spirit of my Father revealed that in your heart. And what you just confessed, and he was soliciting a confession. He said, that's the truth. It is interesting that if you look there at verses 21 and 22, where we last read, notice this. I want you to see that there was a, an immediate thing he had to do. It says in verse 21, he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing. Well, you would think, you know, that not that really the basis of our gospel? That Jesus is the promised Christ of God. He is the anointed one, the Christos, right? The Messiah, the one who should come. And boy, we want to preach that everywhere. And as a matter of fact, later on, the disciples did. Come the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they went everywhere. Even given new languages to preach this marvelous truth. It is the the heart of the gospel. So why was it that all of a sudden, right there, he said, no, shh, 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 shh. Don't say this to anybody. And the very next verse makes it clear that it was just a temporary thing while events were shaping up. He had a life mission to accomplish. And so he goes on to say in verse 22, and this is one of the earlier references to Calvary. And notice that he makes this reference to Calvary in connection with the fact that he is the Christ. Now, this is to be a teaching thing for them. Now, they're, they're supposed to begin to get the idea that Christ is going to suffer. Yes, I'm the Christ. Yes, you just uttered a truth. Peter, God revealed that to you. Now, be quiet about it because he goes and he says, verse 21, the Son of Man must suffer many things, and he must be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. He must be slain. He must be rose again the third day. Now, when all those things right there were suddenly fulfilled realities, the moratorium on speaking his identity of Christ was lifted altogether, and, and he commanded them to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. That was something that they were to do. Now, I want you to notice, second of all, that this question was addressed to those at least to know enough about Jesus Christ to form an opinion. Now, this is kind of an, a, a thought that I want you to get a hold of, okay? When, when he turned around and he asked them, he says, well, who, who do the crowds think that I am? What are they saying? 
Well, the crowds had already been exposed. They'd heard and seen things. They knew about Old Testament prophecies, at least to the degree that they did. And they knew about Jesus Christ because he was the talk of the town. And many of them had been fought. This was taking place in Galilee before he went back down to Judea. He, he went about in a, in a, you know, he was famous. And so they were all circulating ideas about him. And that means that at this point in time, they could, like Simon Peter, look at the Old Testament scriptures, look at the life of Christ, and try and make a connection. Whether or not they were able to do so, they at least had the ability to do that. Now, obviously, this is not the kind of a question that he would have asked people in China or Australia or going over here to the North and South American continent. There were people on earth on that day, but if you would to ask them, what do you think about Christ? They'd say, who, what, right? I mean, those are like what we would call unreached people groups in that day. I want you to understand, at that point in time when he was just beginning to fulfill the reality of the mission that he came on earth, and at that time in the world, there were a lot of people with various states of knowledge about what God was, who he was, what he was planning on doing. And, uh, and in many cases, uh, they were very sorely misled, right? I think in most cases. But when God judges them, those are, those are people that we would just say they're under conscience. God is not going to judge them based on what they do not know, quite so much as what they do know and whether or not they live, uh, you know, agreeable to what they actually know. Uh, the reason why I think this is important, it was even mentioned in Sunday school class, that there is probably out there in our world today, an awful lot of people that if you would, to be honest with you, if you were to ask them, what do you think of Jesus Christ? Who do you think? They, they would have the exact same answer. They would say, who? Christ? What? Now, in some cases, there would be a clear, uh, a clear understanding. I mean, Here's the thing. Not long ago, they had uh, there was a case on record. Some of you, it was in the news. You might have heard about it. There was a fellow down in Brazil. He lived in the uh, uh, Amazonian rainforest in Brazil. He was the last surviving member of his tribe, and his tribe was a totally unreached people group. And they all kind of like died out. And he was a, they just called him a hole digger or something like. He said, you guys hear that story? It was in the news about two months, and they, they found him that he, he did. They'd ne he had never been contacted. He'd never had a Christian witness at all. Completely. And there, there are other people groups there in the Amazon basin that they, they call them, what is it, NPG, um, non-reach people groups or something like that. And uh, there's quite a number of them. Um, there's a, I just went on the website for something called the Joshua Project. And they said that in, in the world today, you have 196 distinct countries. But you actually have 17,428, by their count, unique people groups. Because when Jesus Christ, you know, when he said, uh, go out and uh, preach the gospel to all nations, that word nations there in the Greek, it was ethne. It was ethnicities it was it wasn't so much he wasn't talking about political structure such as like you know pakistan as a nation but if you go into pakistan there may be one nation but there's quite a number of different people groups that have distinct languages um tribal lore and things going on for them so uh, here's the thing the the church has as its ongoing mission the need to try and get that gospel out. And I think it's the most important thing that we are to do here in, in the world today. I mentioned that there were 17,428 unique people groups. According to the Joshua Project, 7,400 of them are considered to be totally unreached. And that's just, they're talking about those that are in the 1040 window. To be honest with you, you could go throughout the United States of America and, and Western nations that once were, once were bastions of Christian Christianity, and you'll find out that there's a darkness that's falling. And there are people that are not hearing 
what they need to know in order to take this question and form an intelligent opinion. And it, it's just, it's a, it's a terrible thing that we should be able to ask anybody in America, what do you think about Christ? And they might look at us and say, Christ, what are you talking about? And are there such people? Obviously, there's not going to be as many of them in America as there are in other places. But yeah, there are people like that. So that, that highlights for us an important job we have to do. Now, there's a third thing I wanted to mention. This same question that he asked to the disciples, very direct and personally applied to them, that same question, it remains today. It is inescapable to everyone who has been confronted with a truth of Jesus Christ, his life, and his works. In other words, our mission in the world today, really, the church was given what we call it the Great Commission. We are to go out and we're to tell the world that God promised a deliverer. Yes, we are in sin. Yes, there is a God who made us. Yes, that God who made us, you know, uh, he, he made a promise way back in the beginning. He said he would send one that could save us from our sin. A Messiah, a coming king, a promised Christ, and Jesus is it. And this is what he did. And this is the gospel. And we're supposed to preach it wherever we go. And um, wherever that gospel does go, people become more accountable. Because all of a sudden, more and more and more. You know, the more that you actually learn about Jesus Christ, the more you have a basis to, to actually form a good and honest opinion about who he was. And, and what I mean by this is, if you go to some place like, well, let's just say that certain areas in the 1040 window, you know, in parts of India where there are people that honestly they wouldn't know very much, their accountability level as compared to a gospel-saturated land like the United States of America, we're way more accountable because we have way more light. God understands that Abraham said, she said, will not the God of all the earth do right? And the answer is, yeah, obviously the God of all the earth will do right. And he knows that to whom much is given, he said, of them much more will be expected. And, and so that's, that's, that's important that we know. Now, I just want to quickly, while we've got a few minutes here, I want to go over some things about this, what, the, the confession that he solicited from them. Uh, and the three things I want to say is this. Number one, in the world today, this confession that Jesus is the Christ, uh, the Christ of God, it is the ordained means of salvation. In other words, you know, if there's somebody that they've never, ever, ever, ever heard that at all, I mean, absolutely at all, then I guess you could make the case like that guy that's down there in the Amazonian jungle, then God, when he brings them up, he's going to deal with them as that he dealt with others in, that were under conscience before him. He will judge that man according to what that man knew. And he did know enough to make him accountable. He knew that there was a, a powerful being. The very facts of creation would have impressed certain truths about his, his mind. Now, only God, you know, here's the thing. I am quite content to allow God do all of the judging because in order to judge another man, you have to know what's in that other man's heart. You have to know what's in that other man's mind. We don't. God and God only can make that judgment. But I will tell you this, that as far as his plan and his purpose today, what he means to do in order to bring a people to his name and for his glory is to give them the gospel, the truth about Jesus Christ. And if they will be brought to the place where they confess that, they will have eternal life given to them. Turn over to the Matthew account. Um, I just want you to look at the parallel account in Matthew because it's a little bit fuller. It's in chapter 16, chapter 16, and I'll begin reading there at verse number 13. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 13, when Jesus was come into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man am? And they said, well, some say that you are John the Baptist, some Elijah, 
and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, but he said unto them, But whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said, Well, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That, that implies that he understood somewhat what was entailed in that word Christ. He said, the Christ, and then he explains what that means or what they were expecting that it would mean. As the Christ, you are the son of the living God. Right? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood is not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I also say unto thee that you are Peter, and upon this rock... I will build my church. He says, you want to know what my church that I'm going to build in this world is going to be built upon the foundation of it? It's going to be built on this rock. Now, what rock did he have in mind? Well, that rock of truth that Simon Peter had just uttered. Simon Peter had made a confession. You're the Christ of God. You're the promised one of God. You're the one that God himself sent into human history as a redeemer, I believe that. You are the son of the living God. And he said, you know, that confession of faith, that's what my church is going to be built out of. And it is throughout uh, the, the whole New Testament. Turn over to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. J.C. Ryle said this. He said, the true meaning of the rock in the passage appears to be the truth of our Lord's Messiahship and divinity, which Peter had just confessed. It is as though the Lord had said, You are rightly called by the name of Peter or a stone, for you have confessed that mighty truth on which, as on a rock, I will build my church. And so we have it here, Romans chapter 10. Uh, look at verse number 9 and 10. Romans 10, 9 and 10. He says that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. He says, you know what? Salvation is a matter of confessing the truth about Jesus Christ, including the fact that he rose from the grave, which uh, there's the implication there of his divinity, of his sinlessness, of his power over the issues of life, that he was accepted even with God. Turn over to 1 John. Uh, the first general epistle of John, and we'll look at it, stated quite, uh, quite uh, uh, forcefully. First John chapter 2. Yeah, chapter 4, verse number 2. Chapter 4, verse number 2. Hereby know you the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. If it confesses that Jesus Christ is God, you know, he's God incarnate, he's God come in the flesh, that is the Spirit of, that is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus the Christ is come in the flesh that's not of God. It's that spirit of Antichrist. Drop down to verse 15. Whoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him, and he in God. This is how important it is that we get this question right. When I said that, you know, there might be a lot of answers, there might be a lot of answers that men can give, but it doesn't matter if you, if you can give a sincere answer. I sincerely believe that he was John the Baptist. That is sincerely wrong. The truth of the matter is Jesus Christ is the divine God and the Christ that God promised to send. And not only that, here's another thing. It's not always easy to confess Jesus Christ in this world. 
I think we're living in a day in which it's getting harder and harder in some ways to go ahead and, and confess uh, Christ in the world, but we ought to do it. And, and the Lord himself regards this as a worthy act, and he knows that the time is going to come in the which, you know, he said, he, he said, you know, the days will ultimately come in which you'll be hated for all man, by all mankind. All nations will hate you for my name's sake, right? But um, it's worthy, and it's even rewardable if we are willing to take a stand as Christians confessing him publicly and before a world that doesn't uh, think very highly of it. Turn, if you will, please, to the Gospel of John, chapter 9. John's Gospel in the ninth chapter. And we're going to see that even in the days when Jesus Christ was yet alive, we're going to move back here, actually, all the way even before Calvary, and we're going to see when the hubbub was just beginning to ramp up and people were formulating these opinions, they were floating these theories around. He was, there were some that they were afraid to go ahead and, and say what they really honestly believed. They, they, like Peter, had the truth beginning to form in their mind, but they didn't want to out with it because of what others might think and say. John chapter 9, verse 22. These words spoke his parents, the parents of the man born blind, because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. That's the rock that Christ said, I'm going to found my church upon. The confession that I, Jesus, I am the Christ. And here's his enemies, his sworn enemies. He says, you know what? You hear anybody making that confession about him, they are claiming that he is the promised Messiah of God. He's there to be excommunicated, they're to be exiled from the synagogue, which that would have been a social disgrace in Israel in that day. Uh, go ahead and flip over to chapter 12, John chapter 12. And it, it only kind of intensified as went by. You know, the pressures began to ratchet up. The closer Jesus Christ got to, Cal to Calvary and what was going to happen there as he was sacrificed, the more his enemies became dead set against him. Yet, at the same time, the more the truth about him was beginning to be received by people's hearts. There were a lot of people waking up to the fact that Jesus was the Christ. And the... Uh, or, you know, the, the punishment for confessing it became increasing too. So if you look at chapter 12, verse number 42, we read this. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also, many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Jesus Christ, at one point in time, he said, you know what, there's coming a point in time in the world when there will be people that actually set themselves to kill you, and in so doing, they will be thinking in their own mind that they're serving God, that they're doing service to God by getting rid of you because you believe in me and you preach in my name. You know, I, 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 we're really not quite in those days yet, at least not here in America, but for the first time, in my life, I can see almost just over the horizon of present circumstance how days just like that could actually visit us in this place. I don't know how far off it might be, but it's never been closer. And here's the last thing that I want to just share with you. I'll just close with this point here, that ultimately every moral, rational being has to make this confession. It's not a question that's going to go away. Sooner or later, everybody's going to have to confess the truth about Jesus Christ, who he is, why he came. You know, people can go to their grave in this lifetime refusing to make that confession, but ultimately the day will come, on resurrection day even, when there will not be a soul amongst mankind, a soul amongst angels anywhere that will be able to avoid confessing the truth 
that right now we have an opportunity to co confess and promote. And uh, turn, if you will, please, to Philippians. I'll just give you one more verse of Scripture, and then we'll be done. Philippians chapter 2, if you will, please. The most vital question that we as people in this world can face. And we read Philippians chapter 2. I'll begin reading at verse number 9. This is Paul's accounting of what Christ did and why he did it as he lived his life and brought himself to Calvary. So he says in verse 9, Wherefore God also has highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, and that's specific, it is not Allah, it is not Krishna, it is not Lucifer, it is not any other name, it is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it applies to that New Testament being that came under the, you know, he had the 12 disciples, we know who Jesus is. And he says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, there's coming a day, and just because every tongue will confess, that's not, that's not a verse teaching universal salvation, by the way. Some people will say, ah, oh, see there, right there, there's a verse that shows that at the very end, everybody will make the confession that leads to salvation. And it is the confession that leads to salvation. And there is coming a day, I'll be honest with you, when Lucifer himself, the leader of the rebellion against the Lord, he shall have to bow his knee and he will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and that to the glory of God the Father. Having made that confession... Those that during their opportunity, I'm talking about men now, that had their life of opportunity, because it is in this lifetime, it's right now. That's why the gospel is so important. There's nothing else, nothing else that we can do that is as important as getting the gospel out to other people. What happened to little Landon there on Wednesday was the most beautiful and wonderful thing that can happen on the face of this earth. The consequences of that are forever and ever and ever. And what we're going to do now is, you know, we're having communion. And communion, what is it? Well, it is the ordinance. It's one of two ordinances. And it is for people that have made exactly that confession. In other words, if you're here and you believe that Jesus Christ is the promised one of God, the Messiah, the one that should come, the very Son of God, who should be king over all Israel, and the head of the eternal kingdom that will bind angels and men and all together under God, that forever. If that's your belief, you know what? Then there are certain things that you receive from the Lord because you have taken him into your heart. You've embraced him as your Lord. And one of those things is you, you receive grace. You receive blessing you receive eternal life and and these elements that we partake of they do kind of point to that so i'm going to have a real quick word of prayer and then we're going to go ahead after that and we will distribute the communion elements heavenly father i want to thank you so much lord for your blessing upon us lord the question goes on and on and on it was posed by god it was posed by jesus christ it was not posed, Lord, because he needed information. It was posed like a seed being planted because all men, Lord, must make that very profound decision. And Lord, help us, Lord, that have made that decision and really truly do know and accept who you are. Help us to realize, Lord, that there's nothing else that we can in this world do, Lord, that has quite so much value to your plan, quite so much importance to others, is that simple expedient of carrying the gospel where we go. Lord, we'll give you thanks for that. In Jesus' name, amen.